got to be in pictures. You're wonderful to see. You ought to be in pictures. Hello, and welcome to Deep Dive Movie Reviews with my friend Steve Hackman and myself, James Marsh. This episode, we continue our Every Best Picture series, looking at all the Best Picture winners from the Oscars throughout their history. And it's a big one this week, 1939's Gone with the Wind. Hey, but before we talk Gone with the Wind, if you could do us a big favor and subscribe to Deep Dive Movie Reviews, just go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And right next to that button is a little bell. And if you tap that every single time we upload a new video, you'll be notified. And just as a reminder, Deep Dive Movie Reviews does contain spoilers, so you have been warned. James, I've been really looking forward to talking Gone with the Wind. Let's do it. Okay, well, right off the bat, I want to get this off my chest. I want to get it out there. I had never seen this before. Gone with the Wind is one of those movies where you just kind of assume that you have seen it. I think enough of it is just out there in the ether, in various sort of pop culture references, memes, what have you, famous quotes, clip reels, you know, you name it, that while I was watching this, you, you know, there were enough moments where I'm like, oh, okay, well, I've seen this bit and I've seen this bit and I know that line and I know mm -hmm. that line. But sitting down and watching all like four hours of it in one go, it, it, very, it became apparent very early on. Oh, no, I haven't actually mm -hmm. ever done this. Or if I have, I was way too young to probably have been paying much attention. So this was great this, to finally get this opportunity to sit down and in a single sitting, do the whole movie complete with overture and the entre-act, you know, and the, the mm. intermission and, and everything. And, um, you know, if, if nothing else, it's quite an event, isn't it? It is, yes, indeed. It, uh, it was an event when it came out in 1939, and it's still an event today. I mean, it is a big production. And even, uh, I mean, we'll get into it, but so many of the production values and just the over-the-topness of it still translates, I felt, to today's, uh, today's audience. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Just the, the craft and the scale of, the, yeah, like you say, the production, you know, the thousands of extras. You know, there's that jumping right into the middle of the movie. There's the scene where she goes into the center of Atlanta. Yes. And, you know, she turns the corner and as far as you can see, the camera just pulls back in one of the most sort of famous shots of the movie, a shot I had certainly seen mm -hmm. uh, on its own before, where it just pulls back and you just see hundreds, no, thousands of mm -hmm. wounded and dead just lying in the streets because there's nowhere else for them to, to be put. And you just know that the vast majority of those were actually people. Yes. You know, that th this there was no obviously obviously no CG, no map paintings even. This that was, you know, a lot of people being a given a good day's work. <laughs> yeah, a lot of extras, a lot of extras. You know, I I don't even know where to begin with this film, but mm. even as you mentioned that scene as a jumping off point, one of the things in rewatching this that I found particularly appealing and I thought was a little unusual for 1939 is how anti-war this film tended to be. There was this initial romanticism that you see with the Southern side, like we're going to lick those Yankees in two weeks or two months or whatever it is. And then you just see what war actually does to a civilization. Uh, it's just a lot of dead people, a lot of misery, a lot of broken families, a lot of crying, a lot of amputations. This yeah. th this film really encapsulates in an early 1939 era how bad war is just as America is getting ready to enter World War II. Well, yes, yes. And I think that's uh, one of the more interesting points of it. Uh, you know, right from the beginning, very beginning, I mean, obviously, I am British, you are American. Mm -hmm. uh, it opens with this kind of sort of almost wistful, nostalgic kind of introduction where it says, ah, oh, now is a moment where we're going to look back and and revisit what might have been this yes. this sort of great sort of magical time of of, sort of the, the deep south of the great south when mm -hmm. you know there there was a uh, an ideal that was held up and then it was challenged and then ultimately it was destroyed. And you're like, hang on a minute. And you realize sitting watching it today, just how many different sort of um, filters this story is is coming at you through yeah. or you you are processing it through. Because obviously, yes, it's set in the 1860s. Um, 
but it and it is adapted from a novel that was written in the 1930s and then told as a film in the late 1930s as you so rightly say on the eve of world war ii so there's some very contemporary uh sort of anti-war themes being stuck in there which perhaps weren't so prominent or uh intentionally used right. for uh, you know in the in the novel and then here i am another sort of 85 years later watching it through 45 years of my own sort of life mm -hmm. experience and you're and you're like wow this is a really sort of heavily sort of uh processed and heavily sort of interpreted and reinterpreted and reinterpreted and recontextualized kind of story and yet still you sit there kind of with a slight sort of snigger kind of going yeah yeah that's not right you know this right, I, this right. I, this image of the deep south that you're trying to be nostalgic about i don't i don't believe ever really quite existed the way that this film wanted to portray it or rather let me say let me say it another way that um i don't think it's it's ever really been something that everybody can agree on mm -hmm. to look back on it right, in in right. this kind of nostalgic kind of way it's always been slightly problematic is the problem <laughs> No, I, I can I can certainly see that, and and I think we'll probably address some of those problematic issues as we unpack this. But um, one of the things that I found, well, I, you know, when we do these kind of films, James, we usually like to talk about what we bring to the table. You admitted you haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I'm the complete opposite. I was an aficionado from a young boy. I read, I'm kid you not, I checked out of Mallow Junior High School, Gone with the Wind, the novel in the seventh grade when I was 12 years old. And oh, I wow. still remember sneaking because I was more the literature drama guy than the maths guy, being in Mr. Mor Northrup's math class in the seventh grade, trying to clandestinely look at read Gone with the Wind because I was so captivated by the story that I wasn't going to let maths distract me from this wonderful novel. And I still remember Mr. Northrup going, Steve Hackman, what, what are you doing over there? What, but come up, what, what are you reading? What, you know, he was expecting a 12 year old boy on the cusp of puberty to maybe be reading something or looking at something that was a little, and he was shocked to find, he's like, gone with the wind. Are you kidding me? You're reading <laughs> gone with the wind. And, uh, he handed so, you a Playboy and sent you back to your desk. That's right. Be be a be a real man. <laughs> uh, but I I loved the story uh, as a novel, and subsequently, when VHS became popular, right around not shortly thereafter, I watched that movie on VHS all the time. Uh, I I for the longest time until Casablanca usurped it a few mm. years later. It was my favorite film. Okay, so, so so what specifically about it uh, did twelve year old Steve really like? That's a, that's a really good question. And uh, one, you know, I've always said in deep dive movie reviews, I'm not driven by special effects and and that kind of visuals, although that can enhance the story. For me, it has to be a really good story. And for me, the whole notion of America at war with itself, with these larger than life characters like Scarlett O'Hara, like Rhett Butler, like Ashley Wilkes, like uh, like Mel Melanie. Uh, I was just compelled by these characters. I found them fascinating. I found them interesting. I wanted to see how this story was going to develop. And even uh, when I was older, as a teenager, I would rewatch it because I enjoyed the story so much. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because, I mean, I think I, I I knew sort of the broad strokes of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I knew that it was set, you know, the backdrop was the Civil War and it was set in, and they were in the South and the mm -hmm. Scarlett O'Hara and Rhett Butler have this kind of tempestuous relationship, which as, as you all know, going in doesn't end well, because right. obviously one of the most famous lines and lines. scenes of the movie is the end. And so I, I went in, you know, very much aware that I know how this ends. Yeah. And to a degree, I suppose, the the very fact that we're, we're you know, we're so deeply embedded with the South 
I was like, okay, well, I know how that ends yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Go ahead. So I was just going to say, so, you know, it, there is a, an element of tragedy sort of woven into the very sort of fabric of it mm-hmm. right from the get go before it even starts. What I didn't necessarily realize just from the bits and pieces that I've seen over the years, even seeing those final scenes before was just how obnoxious and just outright pretty terrible Scarlett O'Hara is as yes. a person. Yeah. Uh, rewatching this again because it had been a little while since I watched it, and I and I should give a caveat to my praise of it earlier, and that it used to be my favorite movie, and I'd be hard pressed to say it would be in my top ten today, mm. even though I still enjoy it very very much. Uh, it has been supplanted by numerous other movies over the years, but in rewatching it again with my wife for this, um, yes, I was. I mean, I always knew the Scarlett O'Hara character, but boy, somebody who would just marry who she needs to marry and manipulate who she needs to manipulate and, and do whatever is needed to be done in order to get what she wants. The narcissism involved is is truly, maybe it's as I've gotten older, I'm more sensitive to it because I've, maybe because we experience people like that and maybe we've been on the wrong end of that at certain points. And so maybe a 56 year old Steve is a little more sensitive to those manipulations Mm. than maybe an 18 year old Steve was, but yeah, that was, that was definitely something that hit me this time as opposed to previous viewings. Yeah. And it's, but it's done in such a way and the story is told in such a way that she is still very much the protagonist, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and even at the end of the movie, the movie still, the movie stays with her. Mm -hmm. You know, and it ends with her saying, you know, sort of, you know, I'll get, I'll get there. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get there. Tomorrow is another day. You know, and yes. I, he may have finally ditched me, <laughs> but I finally. will, I will endure. I will continue. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's almost like the film, and perhaps by extension the novel and Margaret Mitchell and whomever, um, show a resilience and a faith in her as a person and as a character that will that will endure and i wonder whether she is supposed to be representative of kind of the south you know in as much as she makes she it's acknowledged that she makes bad choices uh but at the end of the day you have to continue to stick with her you have to kind of not maybe not agree with her choices not kind of root for her in the conventional way but i felt that the, the you know but the the film is the, I, th- I think the film the film is not telling you the viewer uh to forgive her and but the no, film is saying no. the film is saying uh, i'm i the film am sticking with her i couldn't agree more james and i think what comes through is perhaps that margaret mitchell view of the south that even the worst people have a heart of gold if you go deep enough rhett butler is a scoundrel and a scallywag but he has a heart of gold. Belle, the proprietor of the brothel, may be a prostitute and running Mm. a brothel, but she has a heart of gold. Uh, Ashley Wilkes may have some temptuous longings for Scarlet, but he's going to stay faithful to Melanie. And Melanie is the one pure character in this whole thing. She sees the best in everybody. What's fun to watch Olivia de Havilland as Melanie is even when Scarlett is acting in just the most contemptuous manner, she will put a positive spin on it, which is just incredible. And you, what I what I really appreciate is Clark Gable's um, how he plays Rhett Butler. Rhett Butler has no respect for anybody except mm. Melanie Wilkes, and it's those kinds of relationships that you see in this film that I find compelling. You ask what what does Steve Hackman see in Gone with the Wind? It's those types of relationships that draw me to loving this film. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a story. Well, it's it's definitely a story, you know, about its characters as, as rather than anything else. I mean, the backdrop of the war is always just off screen. You know, certainly there yeah. are, you know, there aren't any big battle scenes. I mean, there are some sort of money shots, if you like, like her trying to escape from, I think it's Atlanta as well, isn't it? In the, when it's mm-hmm. burning down and she's got the horse. And yes, I mean, that yeah. that is a fantastic sort of action sequence. And I think that that, scene alone probably went a long way to the film winning its sort of special technical achievement Oscar sure. that it got. And, you know, I was watching that now, you know, just like last week and kind of going, wow, this is yeah. 
go- a gorgeous to watch, you know, and the way they've shot it and just fantastic. You know, even down to uh, sort of the horse training yes. in those moments and having the horse so close to fire and having to sort of jump over things and through things. I was like, this is this is brilliant, just kind of technical filmmaking here. We won't be able to go into the sheer details of production that went into this film, but I recommend to the viewer, there's a couple documentaries out there that I've seen over the years that really breaks down the making of Gone with the Wind and how they filmed some of those scenes are absolutely fascinating from a 1938-1939 perspective. Oh, yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, these were the days where, you know, human life, was pretty cheap and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and was came secondary certainly to getting the shot yes um, yes o- osha uh what we would be the, the legal health and safety arm of the government <laughs> i don't think was quite as strong back then <laughs> no 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 other unions or anything like no. that it was like no 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 whatever we need to do we're gonna we're gonna get it yes. but it, it was it's funny because even a character like um like mammy who of course mm-hmm. is you know for many reasons and uh arguably so the third most, th- certainly the third most famous character, I would yes. say, in it, after Scarlet and Rhett. Even her attitude towards Scarlet is kind of, dare I say, favorable. Uh, you, you know, know I, it's I, it's it's frustrate. She's frustrated, and she's like the long that there. It is a very strained and long suffering relationship between yes. the two of them. She sees all of Scarlet's flaws but loves her unconditionally yeah. regardless. And you really do feel that this is this is what they want to tell you about sort of the South. It, it's, it's done some bad things, made some terrible choices, behaved deplorably at times, mm-hmm. yet uh, it's, it's, it's one of us. It's part mm-hmm. of, of who we are as a, right. as a nation and, and, the, and division is not the way forward. You know, forgiveness and, and, uh, and acceptance is, is the only way to survive. Well, you know, I married a Southerner. In fact, I do apologize. We, we were married, and it is a completely different culture. Uh, and we were married in Tammy's uncle and aunt's house, which is a, it was a big, beautiful house. Um, and her aunt had a wonderful love for Gone with the Wind. So there's Gone with the Wind mementos and, and, oh, wow. and all, all of that kind of motif runs through the whole house. And Southern hospitality is true. And you see that in Gone with the Wind. It is a different type of hospitality that you would find in the North. And, it, you know, it's like there's a great scene at the beginning when uh, Charles Hamilton calls out Rhett Butler. And, you know, he basically tells Charles, you know, he just wasn't going to take advantage of you. He's the best shot, you know. And uh, Rhett walks, you know, I've you know upset everybody he walks away and ashley just says i don't know i'll go along and see after mr butler after all he is our guest right. and right. uh and there is that is a very real thing now, now scratch the surface and there's all kinds of dramas and things and you know it's but but there is this this level of hospitality mm. that is there in a way that uh, i don't see often in other cultures particularly i could speak as a northerner we don't have that level of hospitality yeah no it's wonderful i mean i've been to the i've been to the u.s uh, many many times and where i have been more often than not is is austin texas Mm -hmm. and and there you know it's it's texas and texas has this sort of ridiculous reputation around the world yes uh but anybody who's been there will argue till they're blue in the face quite literally that that uh, austin is this little bubble of 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 sanity in in the heart of texas but i and i've been probably um 10 times some, over the last sort of decade or so and it's it, i can attest to that completely it's absolutely fantastic everybody you know the number of people who just invited me into their homes yeah. uh you know come and come and have a meal you know have a drink and you know just when you walk into like a restaurant or whatever it's just you do you do feel incredibly welcome and they're just so yes. warm and yeah and there is a kind of um sort of a politeness and a a, a respect yes. for you as as an outsider as a guest which seems completely at odds with odds with your expectation you know because they you know it's it, the, their attitude to people not from around here is is widely known yes. and yeah. um and feared to a degree yeah, yeah. but when you get there it's the complete the complete opposite is true 
and no, everybody is just an is just an absolute sweetheart and just welcomes you with open arms uh and uh could could not be friendlier absolutely absolutely couldn't agree more james i think there's a an issue that comes up whenever gone with the wind uh is discussed in in modern times especially now i think it's hbo that has the rights to it and anytime they show it i Viewers, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do know that when it's being shown on whoever has the license now, there is a warning given in it. Uh, and I forget the exact wording of the warning, but essentially it is, you know, obviously this is dealing with a cultural perspective that is very foreign to us. It's dealing with slavery. Although I wouldn't say the, peop the, the people, uh, the African-Americans, we, we don't see any issues of horrific treatment. There is these images that are hard to get out of the mind that do demean African Americans. I can think of one off the top of my head when they're ringing a bell and there's two little African American boys just swinging in the bell. And there's something about that image of of that that I you know I find is a little bit troubling. Um and then there's also when the the, the girls go off to bed. That's why uh, I was just thinking, for the, yeah. and 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 just the 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 staff is just fanning them and uh yeah, obviously, looking at something like that through a modern sensibility is going to be problematic, to say the least. Yeah, and I think that's, in a way, what is kind of more most uncomfortable about it is how this isn't 12 Years a Slave. You know, this isn't, no. um, you know, sort of a, a poster of the atrocities of the era. You know, and this is a, this isn't a film where they're like, look, look at how terrible it was. This right. is a film saying, look at how it was, and and I think it's the matter of factness, uh, and the way in which we we are we're just seeing those day to day worker day relationships between uh, the different members of of these communities, uh, without really it being addressed. It's just being shown, right? And I think that that is what is sort of sits so um, uncomfortably with a modern audience. You're like, well, how can you show that without mm -hmm reprimanding it procrastinating about it it's just like but because people didn't do that on a daily basis it was just not it was the norm no, and no. um it's it's you know uh, yeah. it, and it wasn't talked about there are there are also i mean obviously some uncomfortable conversations along those lines as mm -hmm. well there's one sequence where quite late on when scarlet has married kennedy frank kennedy and she's taken over his his is it like a, a lumber business isn't it yes. like a lumber business yeah and she wants to employ well not employ but she wants to use um prisoners as manual labor in the uh in the factory because they're they're cheaper mm -hmm. and there's a conversation about oh shouldn't you use african americans well obviously they don't use those words but you know oh, yeah. i feel slightly uncomfortable using other uh, language the, their terminology um, yeah and she's like, no, the, the prisoners are cheaper and we can treat them. We could treat them worse, she says, because you've just had this is after the war, isn't it? Where there's yeah. just been sort of the emancipation, as, uh, the emancipation proclamation and things like that. And there's a sequence. I think there's a sequence early on when she gets back to Tara and finds the whole place in disarray. And th there's certain conversations that her father has, certain things that her father says just about how, uh, you know, how how the black man can will put up with certain things or behave in certain ways mm -hmm. or uh, can deal with the hardships better or and you're just kind of like okay yeah this is yeah, this is yeah. a little uh, this is a little uncomfortable no there 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 is that kind of um it's almost the matter of factness of when they don't mean anything maliciously that it's almost more difficult because yeah. like you said in 12 years a slave arguably that is much more hard to watch and yet there is a message in it under the in the meta narrative of how horrible this is and we can never as a society do something like this again whereas in gone with the wind there's a feeling of oh this is this is normative and in a civil society this is the strata of this this is god's order in the universe and we right. should all just accept this and i've that's actually more disturbing than than maybe 12 years a slave yeah 12 years a slave is a movie that was made a decade ago mm -hmm. and so has to address every every point and when it shows 
uh, the hardships and the brutality. And it's going to amp it up as much as possible in order to highlight just how terrible it was. And in no way leaves anything ambiguous, in no way refuses to discuss it and refuses to demonize it. Uh, you know, Michael Fassbender's character in that isn't a complicated guy, you right. know, in that regard. You know, he he he's humanized in, in tiny moments, but for the mm -hmm. most part, he is a monster who you know treats his slaves deplorably and right that's that's what we're comfortable with talking the way we're comfortable with talking about it today um and i think you're absolutely right it, the thing in the gone with the wind is that it's it like you say it's all normalized right right you know no one no would, one is it, and it would work better i mean i think we'd be more accepting of it if it was you know you almost think of like alfred in batman with bruce wayne it the Scarlett O'Hara almost has the same relationship as he has with Hattie McDaniel's uh, Mammy in this, in that she can speak hard truths to her. Like, that's not the issue. She's not going to get any physical, you know, punishment for that or anything. She, They have a relationship that would almost be like Alfred and Bruce Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that great scene where uh, Scarlett's concocting a way of being able to be around when Ashley comes back from the war and, and Mammy goes, you know what I'm talking about, Miss Scarlett, you know, Mr. Ashley's going to be home there. You're going to be waiting for, for her, him just like a spider, you know, and, and <laughs> that kind of hard truth, you know, she's like, I um, see you. I see yeah, you. Miss Scarlett. I, I know You're the worst. who you are. And <laughs> she just looks at her, you know, there's um, so yeah, it was, it's kind of that, normalizing slavery and mm. making it palatable that's actually harder to watch as a modern audience i think right and and i believe that you know ever since the the certainly since the film has come out it has been criticized for that mm -hmm. for going soft on it yeah. in in that regard and uh almost to the point of rewriting how it all used to be so that they, you know you know completely sort of diluting it and going yeah they weren't so bad you know they were yeah. they were happy in their work it's like shut up shut up shut up no, no, you, can't, no you can't say this no. but there's i think i believe there's always been an element of that that is to the film that has made people uncomfortable that on the one hand i i do believe that you're trying to you know the film is representing things as they were where these weren't daily discussions that were being had yeah. about the hierarchy or what have you but at the same time what you're also doing is showing conditions to be far more civil than they were and far more comfortable than they were and everybody to be far happier in their in their yes. role than they than they were and um yes di diluting what uh let's let's not uh beat around yeah. the bush was an absolutely disgusting well, and and, practice and, and i think one of the challenges that we're watching played out is one you have the time period in which the film is set which is the civil war and then this film is being made in 1939 you know roughly 50 60 years uh, more than about 70 years later and we we things have developed but not a whole lot so mm -hmm. 1939 sensibilities are only slightly more evolved than 1865 sensibilities and you know obviously we're looking back now and i just became aware of a new word called presentism have you heard of presentism it's it's when we try to apply the moral standards of the present day to past time periods and then right. kind of basically retroactively judge them they should have known better whereas you know there's a whole argument behind that which is probably outside the parameters of deep dive movie reviews but it is interesting as a audience in 2021 kind 2022. of 22 we're in 2022 2022 we're, we're almost yeah, to almost the end of 2023 it's, 20, it, it, it's almost uh, yeah time's flying yeah. Um, here we are in 2022 trying to critique a film made in 1939 mm. that is encapsulating a time period in 1865. And yes. it, it makes for interesting discussion, to say the least. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was kind of alluding to at the start. I'm, I didn't know the word presentism, but I, I'm glad I do now because it is an element of, of contemporary film criticism that, that I hate. Mm -hmm. is is the way that people um reevaluate old movies in today's with 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 today's filters and eyes and judgments and prejudices even if they are um presented as uh, not prejudices but acceptance and and all the rest of it um because it's unfair right you know yeah. it's it's you know the film the, you're watching the film out of context 
you know, and so projecting on it, like like the one that really bugs me, and I don't want to get too far off topic, are the James James Bond movies, in particular okay. the the old ones, uh, and how they are a bit mercilessly torn apart these days by by young gen z uh film critics who are like you can't treat women like that you can't do this and it's like yeah. no and you couldn't back then either right but that's yeah. the point you know the point yeah. is yeah. that james bond was like off the leash and doing stuff that that he wasn't that no no uh gentleman was was supposed to be doing um but uh you know and and there's an element and so that's what's so interesting about this film is that it is operating in all of these different time periods simultaneously yes absolutely and um, and I'm quite happy to, to, you know, to hold it at arm's length and look at it in the uh, in the context of 1939 when it came out. Mm -hmm. Look at it and go, look what it achieved. Look what it was able to create and sustain and look at and look at how it was received. Yes. And while there was some criticism, you know, over over its what, what do we call it not whitewashing exactly but the normalization of what the old south was like um and also but it was even back then thankfully criticized for its length because it is way too long well it's not way too long but it is very long let's just yeah. leave it at that it's it's very long um but it was an absolute monster hit it was the biggest box office hit of all time at that point and if you adjust for inflation still is Yes, it is. Three point nine million dollars in today's money. Yes. Which um I think number one at the moment is um Force Awakens, right? In the US. Oh, this this yeah, is in possibly, the US. Yeah, I don't yeah, think this is yeah. globally. It's Force Awakens. And I think that barely scrapes into the top ten. If you readjust for inflation, inflation yeah. um and and yeah, nothing is close to gone with the wind. I think number two is like Titanic or Avatar or something, and is like half that. It's 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 pretty ridiculous. It was so popular. And I think for a number of reasons. I don't think it was so popular because everybody totally agreed with everything in the movie. And they were like, <laughs> no. yes, absolutely. You know, the Deep South was was horribly misunderstood, should have won the war, and everybody there was great. Um, not at all. But it was just such an event. You know, it's the same reason why why Avatar became the biggest movie of all time. It's not the greatest movie in the world. But it's such an event. It's such a spectacle. It's so big and colorful and pushes boundaries, uh, pioneering in technological innovation and what have you. Uh, and Gone with the Wind was all of those things at that time. I think also, too, and, and I'd like to, before we end this, really talk about what an exquisitely great cast helms this film. I mean, Clark Gable is perfect. Vivian Lee perfect olivia de Havilland, perfect leslie howard perfect all four of these main leads are just iconic figures that have been with us for nearly a hundred years now and continue to just just almost like elvis they, they're at that level of zeitgeist that just even if you haven't seen the film like you had you're well aware of the quotes of the story storyline of the characters of what was involved just because it so permeates the dna of particularly american culture but i'm sure it made a, a significant impact on the other side of the pond oh you know without without a doubt you know it's one of those um movies where when you talk about classic hollywood you know it, it's in the it's the, that and wizard of oz and it's probably casablanca you right. know are, are like the three movies that everybody's just like oh yeah they're you know classic hollywood i know what you're talking yeah. about um it's just there and i think that's why you can kind of go through life feeling like i know that movie I, i'm sure i must have seen it you know i know i know everything about it um and it's only when you sit down and spend four hours you know looking at, at every moment of it you realize oh actually no i hadn't seen right. this because it is so ingrained in in the culture in the legend that is hollywood that it's, it feels like it's it's always been there well james as always we want to look at gone with the wind and its presence at the 12th academy awards tell us a little bit about that uh, yeah, I mean, Gone with the Wind broke a number of records at these Oscars, uh, the most number of nominations ever with 13. And then it went on to win the most number of wins, which was eight. Uh, it, and then it also won a pair of honorary Oscars as well, as 
as we are talking about it today, it won Best Picture. It won Best Director for Victor Fleming, who managed to retain his director credit, even though, you know, other directors were were involved. Yeah. Uh, he came on after George Cukor had had uh, started production and then been ceremon- unceremoniously fired. Um, I think Sam Wood came in towards the end. Uh, so there were a number of different people in the director's chair, but but it's widely considered that Victor Fleming was was responsible, and he certainly was the man who won the Oscar. Um, Vivian Lee won Best Actress. Uh, Clark Gable didn't win. No. Best uh, Actor, but I think it's not. I don't think that should be taken as a slight on his performance. I think it's just the fact that he had been, I think, at this point in about three or four Best Picture winners in the yes. 30s and he had already won twice i think he won for it happened one night and i think he had won for something else as well and i think just the way voters are they're like well are we going to give it to gable again yeah or should we just give it to somebody else so uh they they went elsewhere with it uh but of course uh the big the big win the big historical achievement of the night was uh hattie mcdaniel yeah, for best supporting actress, I believe that she was the first uh, ever African American performer to be nominated, mm-hmm. uh, and then beat out Olivia De Havilland among other nominees to win to become the first African American uh, performer to win an Academy Award, which she would remain until Sidney Poitier, Sidney Poitier in the, yes. in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then and Halle yeah. Berry, I think. After well, Halle that. Berry um, in 2001 for Monsters Ball remains the only African American actress to win Best Actress to this day mm-hmm. but um a number of a number of uh, women of color have won best supporting actress in the years since right um right including sort of uh, viola davis <clears throat> octavia spencer uh monique but i think oh. arguably the most interesting awards that it won were the two honorary awards i always think it's fascinating when the oscars and they've done this a number of times in their history is they they create a category mm-hmm. You know, they're just like, oh, we just have to give you a, a special award for just something amazing that you did. And there were two that it was given. There was a special award was given to William Cameron Menzies for outstanding achievement in the use of color for the enhancement of dramatic mood in the production of Gone with the Wind. And uh, we've already spoken just about how incredible the mm-hmm. color cinematography is in this how, movie. how did they get that whole title on the uh, award itself? It must have wrapped it around or something. <laughs> Yes, it's go- it goes right up his midriff. Yes, right. yes, it's. And then there was another technical achievement award to Don Musgrave Grave and Selznick International Pictures for pioneering in the use of coordinating of coordinated equipment in the production Gone with the Wind. So make of that what you will. But I, yeah, I imagine it's to do with some of the action scenes, the stunt sequences that we right. were talking about, just the the scale of some of those sequences. Well, it makes you wonder too, because 1939 is not without its very strong nominee contenders for Best Picture. We've got Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. We've got Wizard of Oz, which has its own technical achievements. And and arguably, both of those films have stood the test of time uh, almost to the degree as Gone with the Wind. Oh, I mean, it's an incredible year. If you look at what Gone with the Wind was up against, Goodbye, Mr. Chips, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Ninochka of Mice and Men, Mm -hmm. Stagecoach, you know, widely regarded with, as one of the greatest westerns of all time, The Wizard of Oz, Wuthering Heights. With, uh, uh, it was that would be Lawrence Olivier, wouldn't it be Wuthering Heights? Yeah, with Merle Oberon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there, any any of those uh, uh, would would have been a worthy winner. That's a great crop of movies. Uh, but Gone with the Wind, I think, was just operating on another level, and obviously, I think the tide of public opinion was it was such an event. Yeah. It was a it was a behemoth. It was just one of these uh, sort of juggernaut sort of technical extravaganzas that just comes in and just sweeps every case. It's like Lord of the Rings or Titanic sure. or Ben Hur or you know it's it's one of them. It's, it's probably the big one. Yeah. It's arguably it's the first one of its kind that would become something of a uh, of an Oscar tradition. Well- well, I would even say, as we started this series in 1929 with Wings, I think we we're all waiting to get to Gone with the Wind, which actually and almost mentally becomes like an achievement. Like, we've finally reached Gone with the Wind, and now there's a slew of great movies. Not that we haven't seen some good movies before, but I think we're really entering 
that golden age of Hollywood. There's some yeah. great films that I'm looking forward to reviewing in this series in the next decade of Academy Awards. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I think what we've witnessed in the 30s so far is sort of filmmakers and studios finding their feet, pushing the boundaries of, you know, what, what a big sort of what a big sort of hollywood movie can be at this mm-hmm. at this time and i think i think it's you know it's it's no um secret to sort of or outrageous claim to state mm-hmm. that gone with the wind is the kind of the pinnacle of yeah. hollywood thus far really yeah, yeah. And, it, and it really maintains that title in a lot of critics eyes too it does it does i mean i think I'm slightly trepidatious about that. I mean, there's one of those things where it's like Citizen Kane topping, you know, greatest film ever made yeah. lists for decades and decades and decades. It's, it's, you know, there there are certain movies that are so set in stone as right. classic, 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 that it it takes a long time or it takes a a big push to uh, to dethrone them, if you yes. like. Yes. Yeah. No, but I, agree, I, I but agree. but I think that this uh, having now sat down and having now watched Gone with the Wind, I get it completely. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. sure it's problematic and it and it you know broaches some topics in ways that they could not and, w- and would not and should not be broached today. But but that's okay because it, it wasn't made today. No, it no, was it made wasn't. nearly eighty or over eighty years ago, mm-hmm. and back then. Uh, you know, well, it's it's not for us to say whether it was okay to make it or not. It, well, it even was if made. you even if you made it today, you still have to put those scenes in there. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's just how would you? <clears throat> what I find with a lot of films these days is when they have to capture a unsavory period of our past, they will usually counterbalance it. For example, we're watching Peaky Blinders right now. There's only so much modernization you can do with about talking about Irish gangs operating in England, North England in the 1930s. There's only so much representation that you can bring in. There's mm. only, you know, you're capturing a time period that was not particularly favorable to people of color or to women. But you see what Peaky Blinders tries to do is they really strengthen a lot of the female characters. They, they, they don't make them the pushovers. They give them a voice. They give them an agency within the parameters that wouldn't upset the dynamics of what 1930s would be. And that's probably what Gone with the Wind would do to a certain degree. They would they would smooth some of the rougher edges in a way that would make the film more palatable, but still allow us to be able to capture what that time period's social mores would be, but maybe in a less you know, a, a more palatable way. Yeah, I mean, maybe in a more palatable way by being less palatable about it. Uh, you know, I think yes, that those absolutely. scenes, yeah. those scenes in mm-hmm. Tara on the plantation would be would be sh- have sharper edges. They mm-hmm. would have thornier thorns. Mm-hmm. And I think the attitudes of the family members who who own and run it would need to be more exaggerated, one way or the other. Right. They would either right. need to be totally for it and therefore bad people yeah. or they would need to see the error of their ways and do something about it in right. order to redeem themselves i'm but, not sure that you could make a film with scarlet o'hara being scarlet o'hara the, in the way that she is in gone with the wind today and still have audiences uh respond favorably but i think what makes this beautiful to watch and kind of a a a time capsule is we get to see how 1939 addressed this issue but i know like even my wife's grandfather i remember one time when he was still alive him telling us some stories about growing up and he would use the n-word but not in a malicious way he would use the n-word about the the couple down the street that he really liked or the young, you know, he, it was in a way it was in the way that we described that it made it almost harder to listen to because he was saying it not maliciously or not to denigrate them. But that is just the term he used, even with people of color that he liked. Mm. And, and it was just a, it's, it's a mindset from a certain time period that, 
is gone with the wind. <laughs> Very well put. And I think that's the point. I think that's why you couldn't make it today mm -hmm. because it requires you to do that to a degree. Yeah. And I think nobody involved would be comfortable with it. Right. And the audiences right. certainly wouldn't be either. Well, it's interesting. Years ago, I remember going to the Denver International Film Festival and they did a spoof. There was a there was a highlighted film that was a mock documentary as if the Confederacy had won the war. So they had and uh, like essentially you could go on to Home Shopping Network and buy an African-American like they were really spoofing this to highlight how absurd it was. It was it was meant to be anti-racist, but by accentuating all the things if we had today's system, but we allowed for slavery, what would we see on TV? What would we see on the streets? And the director had a, a Q&A afterwards. And he got asked something. It's been quite a few years since I saw this, but he got asked a question essentially like, how did your white actors deal with, you know, recreating some scenes that are very offensive, obviously? And it was a black director who had done this. So mm. I, I don't think a white director could have done this film, but it was a it was an African American director. <clears throat> and I remember him answering the question by saying, What's really interesting with actors is I can have them, you know, in an acting scene, they could rape, they can pillage, they can commit the most violent acts, and it's just acting. They don't think anything of it. But if I ask a white actor to do something that's really racist in the film, I have to have a group therapy session with them beforehand. Yeah. And he said, and and I forgot how he elaborated on that, but that always stuck with me, in that this is the one area that. Uh, is really, really sensitive and and rightfully so. I think so, because I think it's where you're most vulnerable to being misinterpreted, because I think there's a way that mm -hmm. you can, if you if you're perceived to be a little over enthusiastic about it, then sure. people might think that there's a little bit of yourself coming through it in a way that when you're like raping or murdering somebody on screen, I imagine I imagine people are more are quite happy to give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Well, James, as we draw this to a close, obviously, whenever we do every best picture, the big question we ask ourselves is, does it stand the test of time? Does it earn its place in Oscar history? Why don't you start us off? Okay, well, I will start off by saying, uh, does it earn its place in Oscar hero history? Without a doubt. Yeah. You know, this this is absolutely, you know, classic blockbuster epic filmmaking uh of of the highest order you know this this is what you mean when you talk about an epic movie mm -hmm. you know it's it's a it's it's just so lavish it, huge sets huge locations you know, huge casts everything is just huge and massive and brightly colored and and it's really long and it goes on forever and you've got these great actors giving career defining performances at the top of their game it's making history left right and said whilst you know possibly even reinventing history along the way or uh, seeing it through rose tinted glasses and so for that you know does it deserve uh, the reputation that has does it? I think it has a, a realistic reputation. I think it's been around so long, and everybody has seen it, even me now, that everybody kind of knows what it is. Mm -hmm. Everybody, and and it's and that is kind of why it continues to exist. I think is because it is such an interesting approach to some incredibly sensitive material. Does it deserve to stand the test of time? Yeah, yeah, it really does. Because I think ultimately it's it's coming from a how to, how to put this i th okay i think it's relatively harmless in the way that it presents a lot of this stuff i think there's enough mm. historical context in there that it's not going to give anybody sort of the wrong idea or of how to behave today or anything like that i don't think it's going to influence people uh to to sort of uh, become more racist or anything right. like that um yeah, it is. A, it is kind of slightly sort of rose tinted, um, mm -hmm. but I think it gets away with it because even when it was made, it was it was already kind of a period piece, right? And right. I think so. I think that helps. I think it is more interesting watching it today and seeing how um, our attitude, how the attitudes have changed threefold. Um, how it what it is kind of can be perceived as a kind of uh, allegory for the horrors of war at a moment when the country was was on the brink of 
you know, another world war. Um, but I mean, so the, the short answer is yes and yes. I mean, it really does. It is, it's, it's just a, a big romping epic that has some uh, outdated uh, approaches to uh, race relations and uh, portrayals of the South and, and what have you. But I think does it in a relatively innocuous way that you can just sort of forgive and be entertained by. No, absolutely. And, you know, I agree. Obviously, it does stand the test of time. It does deserve its place in history. I've already alluded it's one of my favorite films of all time. But like you said, you know, when you read a little of the history, when this film came out, there was a three day celebration in the city of Atlanta. There was limousines and parades. And they said, you've never seen so many Confederate flags as when this film came out. And obviously, in today's time frame, that would just be anathema. And 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 rightfully so. But, you know, it's interesting, though, a lot of the critique and discussion about race in this film, if you think about it, race is actually just a small part. It's a four hour film, as you mentioned. And there is so much that this film is addressing and and race and interactions between white and black in this film are actually not that often. Uh, I mean, obviously, Hattie McDaniel won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. And she has obviously the highest profile of a of a, a woman of color in this film, but even her her role is not that large. She's in, not in, in it that much in, in comparison she, really? to the no in comparison. So I think a lot of the the discussion around this issue is completely at times disproportionate mm. to some of the other aspects of this film that that you know obviously take much more of a center stage. I think maybe it is, it is, it's interesting that you say that, that it is because of Hattie McDaniel winning an Oscar for this film, that it's, that the two things are inextricably mm. connected, mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it was such a kind of milestone for race and right. for race relations in Hollywood at that moment, uh, that, and it's, it's one of the things that the film is remembered for because of Hattie McDaniel's success that it kind of filters down into into the film as well yeah and and, and the juxtaposition uh is in the midst of racism which obviously was much much worse in 1939 that the human race in america and specifically in this situation was evolving to the point where a the academy could give a major award to a woman of color which is a step of evolution, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe we should have had a lot more in the in the subsequent years. And we're, you know, we've had Oscars too white and, you know, we're addressing some of those issues, but it's it's all steps forward. And I look at her win as a as a step forward in, in the evolution of our humankind. Yeah, no, I think that's the thing is that I think her win was this huge sort of watershed moment. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it didn't open the floodgates. No. And that no. it didn't it didn't correct yeah. anything. Yeah. You know, we arguably at all. Uh, you know, and and in the decades since, you know, it it hasn't you haven't seen sort of an an equality uh across the awards like uh it suggested that yeah. that we might. Well, Malcolm uh Malcolm Gladwell talks about there's an actual term for this. And I forgot what the term is, but he does a whole podcast on it, that when a society actually makes an achievement in some kind of particularly like in a race issue, then it will actually swing the other way because now we've proven that we're not racist. So mm. and he gives these he gives these wonderful examples, I mean, culminating with, you know, our first African-American president, Barack Obama. And then we swing all the way to, to Donald Trump after after that, which the, the juxtaposition couldn't be greater. But there is a, a societal and a, a sociological term that this is a this is a very real thing. And it would explain why if we give a woman of color an Academy Award in 1939. We're we're absolved from having to do it again for quite a while. Yeah, which yeah, which yeah. is obviously just ridiculous. Well, that's our thoughts on Gone with the Wind. What are your thoughts? We would love to hear what your perspective is on this wonderful extravaganza of a film that we've just reviewed. Feel free to go ahead and leave your comments in the box below. Also, James and I are on social media, and so you'll find links below to us on Instagram as well as Twitter. James. 
That's right. Anybody else there has not seen Gone with the Wind or have just seen it for the first time? Any other great classic Hollywood epics uh, that you're willing to put your hand up and confess that you haven't seen? Uh, do let us know and uh, maybe we could start a whole new series about sort of our list of shame or something like that of, of great movies that we've never seen before. Citizen Kane. <gasps> I know. Oh, I know. Wow. I, I forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. <laughs> I, I have to, uh, you know, there's always one and that's I uh, we will address it. We, we're going to have to, aren't we? Yeah. Until but it won't be in this episode. Take care, everybody. Bye. You're wonderful to see. You ought to be in pictures. Oh, what a hit you would be.